Welcome back, AP Calc, AP students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School. And I want to also welcome you to the first video that covers the first main idea, big idea of AP Calculus, and that is the idea of the limit. You'll notice here, I'm going to take topics one, two, and one, four, and I'm gonna merge them together it's not often that I skip around through the course and exam description from the College Board, but I got a, a slew of videos coming up later on that will walk you through topic 1.3, how to find a limit uh, graphically. So let's take a look at these two ideas, defining a limit and using limit notation, and then how to find this limit using a table of values. So what we've got here in our first example is a function that you're probably not too familiar with. And I'm going to move my camera out of the way here. And you can just see up above, you've got that function f of x equal x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1. And then just to make sure, I told you that x cannot equal 1 in that function. And I... I think it should be apparent why that x can't be 1, but we're going to talk about those ideas later on in this particular unit when we cover the ideas of discontinuities. It's likely you've talked about those already in a pre-calc class. So I have gone ahead and sketched this graph for you because I kind of figured you probably haven't worked with this graph very often. And there it is over to the right. Now you might be surprised that this graph kind of looks like a parabola. It's got a weird little feature right here. It is a parabola with a hole in it. That's exactly what's happening. And if you try to graph this with your graphing calculators, it's probably not going to render very well. In other words, it's not going to show that hole. Very few graphing simulators can place these removable discontinuities, these holes, into their graphs because of the way that they're programmed. So I've gone ahead and provided that for you here. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you are a little bit, uh, I guess, intrigued why this looks like a parabola, because you're taking an x cubed kind of function and dividing it by an x to the first kind of function, which produces an x to the second type of function. Yep, there's definitely a connection as to why that this is a parabola. But we're not concerned about that. What we are concerned about is this question right here that I'm going to highlight in yellow. What is f of x approaching as x approaches 1? That's an unusual question, isn't it? So let's like use our fingers and trace along this graph on both sides of x equal 1. Now, I, I can't really do that for the purpose of this video. So instead, I'll just use my pen and say my left finger, my left hand, would be riding along this part of the graph while my right hand or right finger, index finger, would be writing along that part of the graph. And the question is, is what does the y value, f of x value, approach as I get closer and closer to this target of 1? And I hope that you guys will see that the answer is this value here, 3. And that's because our fingers get so close together at that y value. They don't touch. This is not a roundabout that you can just go around, but they come very close to meeting, and that's good enough to say that the y value is 3. Now, that's the answer to this question. But I want to make this question a little bit easier to ask in the future, <clears throat> because what I've highlighted here in, in yellow is quite a bit of words. So instead, we can use the notation that I have here highlighting in orange. We can put this LIM statement in front of our expression and put an X approach 1. That's how we would read that little arrow. And so this whole thing can be read as the limit as X approaches 1 of X cubed minus 1 over X minus 1. It's also acceptable to reverse the order and say the limit of x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1 as x approaches 1. And so we know that that answer is going to be 3 because we have this wonderful graphical evidence of that. 
But I also want to tell you that there's another way to do these in case, let's say that you didn't have a graphing calculator, but maybe you had a calculator that would be able to allow certain X's to be plugged into this expression and thus it would spit out outcomes. And so we can find this limit numerically using a table of values. And that's kind of what the 1.4 part of the lesson is, estimating limits from tables. And so here you go. I have this table for you that I'm going to have us complete. And we're going to use our graphing calculators. Now I want to make a concession here. We're going to go ahead and round all of our decimals to three places. I think that's going to give us enough to kind of see what's happening. Let's go to our graphing calculators and take a look. So here we are. Now we're using the TI Inspire, but you could do this with virtually any graphing calculator. If you're using a TI-83 or a T-84, you would go into the Y1 equal menu. Here with the Inspire, we just go into our graphical menu, which I'm still working in a scratch pad. And remember, you can just toggle the scratch pad button on and off to go between a calculator page and a graphing page. So first things first, we're going to enter this uh, fraction control divide. Uh, I believe that is um, on the TI Inspire. You can access uh, by hitting um, a button and then your F1 menu to get your fractions. I'm going to go X cubed on top. Make sure you get out of that exponent by pushing the right keypad button and then you can add your minus one. So the minus one's not an exponent or an in, inside the exponent. And then we'll jump down to the denominator and enter X minus one. And if all goes well, we should see pretty much the same graph. Pretty much the same graph, except, yeah, we're struggling a little bit with what's happening right here. And we'll have a conversation another day about what really is going on there if you zoom in enough. But for right now, let's just understand that there's supposed to be a hole there. We can still find this limit whether that hole shows up or not. Now, in order to be able to put a table onto your graphing calculator on the Inspire, you're going to uh, click on uh, a shortcut, Control-T. Now, what that'll do is it'll divide the screen in half, where the left side is your graph and the right side is a table of values. And you can see you have your X column and you have your F1 of X, which is defined by that function that we entered. Now, the bad thing about this table is that it preloads all of these values for X, and you cannot type in anything to change them, unfortunately, at least not yet. We need to set this table so that we can change those. So what we're going to do is we're going to push the menu button. Notice the menu button when we're in that table part of the screen gives us completely different options than if we were on the graphing part of the screen. And we're going to go down to option two and we're going to change the settings of the table. So that's option five, edit table settings. Once you do that, all I really need you to do is to change the independent variable. That's the X. The dependent is the F of X. We only need to change the independent from auto to ask. Basically, that's going to allow the calculator to ask us what we want. Therefore, we can enter them. And then the dependent variable is on auto, which means the calculator is going to do the work for us. So once you hit OK, everything will probably disappear. And now you can just enter those values exactly the way that they appeared in your notes. Now, if you go from the far left to the far right, as x approached that 1, you might see that we had 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0.999, and we're going to go ahead and put 1 in there just for kicks. Oh, well, that's interesting. And then we put 1.001, 1.01, and then finally 1.1. Now, it really doesn't matter what order you entered those. Uh, I just wanted them to be entered in a way that they were sort of numerically uh, logistic. You know, they, they go from the smallest to the largest. And so what we're going to do is we're going to transfer all of these values into our table. And I want you to kind of look at this one, noting that it's undefined, which is probably why we have a hole. Let's go ahead and fill in our table. 
and here we are with our table and if I enter those points the way that they appeared on the calculator I would have 2.71 2.970 or 97. We got 2.997 right here. This is the one that we knew was undefined. You could also abbreviate that UND. We would all understand. 3.003. 1.01 gave us 3.030. And then 3.31 is what we had when we plugged in 1.1. Now, what I'm going to do is try to draw your attention to the values that are closest to 1, because that's what this limit was all about, right? X was approaching 1. And what better way to approach 1 than to get as close to it from both sides, like the 0.999 and the 1.001, which gave us these two green highlighted values. And so what you would have to do is look and see, well, if this was going to continue, if we were to get closer to 1, what seems to be the trend? What Y value do you think these guys essentially approach? And hopefully you would believe it to be three. Now, later on in some of the exercises you're going to do, you might not be so convinced at this stage, but you could just get closer and closer to one. Something that you can try on your own is to type in 0.99999. 1.000001. How many ever zeros you want, how many ever nines you want, get closer to one on both sides, and you're going to find that your result is confirmed. You're just going to be getting closer and closer to three. Limits, a very weird idea, but it's something that I want to make sure that you start to get very comfortable with. And I think one of the best quotes that I can provide are limits are more about the journey. It's about what is happening as you travel towards your target of one. They're not so much about the destination. And that destination, I think, was the Y value of three. Because sometimes that destination can never be reached, like in the case of this problem here. We're never, ever going to be physically at the point one, three, because the point one, three it, it doesn't exist on this graph, right? But the question isn't, what is the y value if x approaches 1? It's what does the y approach, or what does the y value become? And that's the big difference. The bottom here, I've got the TI Inspire tutorial that you'll see in the notes for students at Avon High School, so that if you forgot how we ended up um, performing this particular calculation on your Inspire calculator, just take a look at this method one, and that will outline that whole process of using the Control T feature. And if you want your table to disappear, Control T will turn it right back off. All right, hopefully this makes sense. It gives you a basic introduction into what limit notation is and how to find a limit uh, using a table. Stick around for some more videos that are gonna focus on how to find the limit using a graph. Until then, keep studying and we'll see you next time.